Let's get started. Welcome everyone. Hi, Tootsies. Welcome to Reunion. We're so glad that you're here today. And Adam Dorsey, is that you? It is de <laughs> definitely me, Catherine. I remember you from a few years ago when we graduated. It feels like yesterday. So glad to see you. <laughs> it's been so long. Didn't you do a TED talk, a TEDx talk on friendship? It's funny. I just did one last week on friendship. Uh, you did. It, <laughs> Uh, yeah, specifically, Peter, on how it shows up in adulthood. And it the star vignette is actually my best friend from Pitzer. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, well, let's incorporate that in our discussion. That is so cool. Today, yeah. we are celebrating friendships and Pitzer friendships. And we're hearing from sociology professor Peter Nardi. And we had a class with him in Avery Hall back in the 80s. Adam True? Uh, so true. It was called Computers, Computing, and Society, and he wow. was awesome. <laughs> Back in the 80s, and wow. what system did we use for computers? You're not going to believe this, but it was called, and it makes everybody who sees me in my office in Silicon Valley laugh when I mention it was a VAX. A VAX. Wasn't it Deck 10? It was, well, you were, you were, you were, you gave me the very, my very first demo of what an intranet could look like wow. <laughs> and we can talk amongst amongst ourselves i remember well that it was a vax system there weren't any anti-vaxxers back then that's <laughs> all we had yeah nice pun my friend and a fun fact about dr nardi did you know he started teaching at pitzer all the way back when led zeppelin was still like playing in 1975 <laughs> and that his last 10 years at Pitzer College, he was dean of faculty. Yeah, and when President Laura Trombley took a year off, Professor Nardi was acting president. Mm -hmm. so one semester, had... one semester. <laughs> Pretty badass. Yeah, I know. I tried to raise my salary. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Nardi has been overall at Pitzer for over 33 years, and that's a fantastic career. And he knows a lot about friendship. We're so happy to have him. Welcome, Professor Nardi. Hell yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this began one year I did a freshman seminar on friendship. And one of the things I asked everybody to do was to keep a diary of making new friends since everybody was new to college. You know, what was it like? And they would write down, you know, what they did every day. And we'd talk about it in the seminar and all that. Four years later, I had a dinner for the people who were still at Pitzer from that freshman seminar class. And I asked them once again, what was your friendships like, you know, in the last four years? One of the things that happened freshman year was they all were very sad. They would never have friends like they had in high school. That was their biggest concern. I'm never going to make new friends. It's not going to be at all like what I had when I was back in high school. They're the best friends I'll ever have. Senior year, guess what they were saying? The best friends I ever had, I made in college. I'll never make friends like this again, and so on and so forth. Well, I'm going to ask you alums the same question. Who are your friends? Are they from high school? Are they from college? Uh, where are they, and how did you maintain those? That's something we could talk a little bit about. I really want to make this a, a discussion rather than a lecture. So one of the things I want to begin with, though, is that we often make distinctions about different kinds of friends. You know, we all have categories. And I think of it more as a series of circles. You know, there's our best friend maybe in the middle. And next to it is maybe our, our, our close friends. And then next level might be casual friends or acquaintances. How do we make that distinction? You know, what is, how do we draw the line between them? What does that depend on? And as we get older, we tend to narrow down those kinds of levels. You know, uh, we, we tend to focus more. We get involved in our romantic relationships. We get involved with other job-related relationships. And so those circles get narrower and narrower and smaller and smaller. And of course, it becomes harder to make new friends because many people say friendship is the, re is the residual. What you have time left over for is what you do with your friends. But these are some of the ideas that come out. And I'll talk a little bit maybe later or bring it up if, if someone doesn't do that already. Uh, like, how do you do and how do you make friends? 
And one of the other questions is, uh, how do they vary? Some people say by gender, by race, by sexual orientation. How do these things vary by social class? What does it mean for, for people in different categories for them to define friendship, to make friendship, to maintain friendship, and also to lose friendship? How do we lose it? How does it end? So let me begin, I've tossed out a couple of things that we can start talking about, but let me ask you, go back to my first question, my freshman seminar to my senior reunion of my freshman seminar question. Who, what happened to your high school friends? What happened to your college friends? Are you still in touch? Tell me, let's start talking to each other. And who's controlling the volumes? How do, how we, how do we want to do this? Because I know when you talk, um, it, it focuses on that person, or if you cough, it might switch. So maybe you unmute yourself when you want to talk. Is that how you want to do this, Jill? OK. Yes, that yeah. works quickly. <laughs> yeah, Emily, it looks like, yeah. OK, um, I'm class of 71. And I, I want to share my experience this last year. I have a, a tight group, seven of us from high school, believe it or not. Wow. And uh, we have we over the years, we've gotten together once once a year for a weekend. These are girlfriends. And um, uh, because of the pandemic, we didn't get together. And then someone suggested, well, can we have a Zoom? Can we have Zoom meetings? And so we have been meeting once a week and it's scheduled same time each week. And because of that technology, we've actually become closer because uh, we've made the time by scheduling it. And when you don't have that, you tend to, uh, you know, well, well, let's get together in a couple of months or in, you know, next month or something like that. And it doesn't happen. But I, I wanted to share how, uh, something positive came out of the uh, the pandemic with because of technology. Do you find your closest friends then are high school friends or the ones you made in college or after? For me, it's high school. Okay, all right. Somebody else, what are your experiences with high school versus, because again, my freshman, those who came in late, I was saying my freshman seminar uh, students would say, I'm never gonna make friends like the ones I had in high school. My senior year, they said, I'm never going to make friends like the ones I had in college. And then at alumni reunions, I hear different things. So anybody else like to pick up on that question? Who do you see as your friendship, closest friendship circle? Where are they from in your life? Hi, hey everyone. I'm Josue Pasillas, uh, graduated Hello. in the class of 2017. Wow. Um, so when I went to college, I had a, a very close group of friends from high school. Um, and I, I, I live in Illinois. And so when I left that group, it was, I mean, it was like a 2000 mile uh, trek to the West um, and I left them behind. And so I felt um, a little disconnected from my high school friends. And I think that that's what grew me into meeting new people in college and growing that group of friends in college that to this day, I'm very close to still. Um, but I, I managed to stay close to my high school friends as well. So I have these two different sets of friends that I'm very close to. And I talk to both um, groups probably two to three times a week, if not daily, um, some weeks. And all that is, uh, you know, phone calls or texts. We don't do Zoom meetings. Um, so the pandemic really didn't change um, much of the friendship because we've already, we were already connected via phone and text. Um, but we do um, make the effort to see each other at least a few times a year. One of the things that differs from the studies I've done over the years, and certainly from when I was doing the freshman seminar, is we now have something called Facebook and other social media. And the word friend is now a verb, right? Yep. Which to me, is sort of symbolic of the change in many ways. And some people have like 2,000 friends or whatever. I mean, can that be? <laughs> I mean, what does that tell you about what we now define as friendship? I mean, how many of those are acquaintances? That circle of people I mentioned, how far along are they? And how do you make them and how do you maintain them even? That becomes a real difficult question sometimes to ask and to figure out. 
One of the things I people often ask, what freshmen were asking me when I was teaching that seminar is how do I make friends? How do I do it? How do I go about it? And one of the things that studies often show, at least historically, again, with social media, there's a different way of doing it because that's how people date now and do all that. But one of the questions is um, disclosure and reciprocity. Those are the two basic variables, I think, that are really related to making and maintaining friendships. So let's imagine you meet someone in your dorm or wherever your place of work now for many of you and other places like that, you start talking and you start disclosing stuff. Oh, you like Chinese food too? I do too. You know, I love, I love uh, Truffaut old French movies or whatever. And you start making notes and comparisons and you start feeling something. In fact, many people argue the process of, of maintaining, of making a romantic relationship is the same process as making a friendship. It begins the same way, but obviously there's another variable in the romantic one that comes in. I used to put on the board, give me all the characteristics of your best friend. Give me all the characteristics of your romantic friend. And they were often the same. The only difference was sex <laughs> in some cases. That was the difference between the two, but it had to be more. You know, and some people would define an X factor or something like that. But the process of making a friend was often very similar. So you find common ground, you find similarities. And then from there, you say, all right, let's go to the next level. You start disclosing stuff to them. You start giving personal information. Uh, you start talking about your childhood, maybe a problem in the family, maybe some good luck that happened in the past. You start disclosing personal information and they reciprocate. If they don't, that maintains it at the, the lower level of acquaintanceship. And you know, because <clears throat> we all have people we say, well, I am the one that's always talking about my personal things. I never get anything back. And that may be one of the first early signs that that's not gonna be a very close friend. But when there is reciprocity for the disclosure, then you start developing what could be ultimately a best friend, or if there's that romantic sexual element, a sexual relationship, a friendship relationship, a romantic relationship. But let's take that out of the picture for the moment and just focus on friendship. Yeah, yeah Peter, uh, this is Diana Ryan. Yeah. And um, hi. Um, mm. I think that proximity is something that um, kind of is a, precursor to disclosure and, and reciprocity. I mean, we have to be in the same zone, whether it's in the same room or neighborhood or <laughs> school or something, right? Yes. And, and, and yes, Facebook is sort of a game changer there because we can you know, make friends with people around the world. Um, but um, one of the ways that I've made the most lasting friendships is um, housemates. And there you have the proximity and there you have opportunities to hang out without making an appointment. <laughs> and, um, and you, you know, live some of your life events together and um, bond through that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're talking about, you know, friendship is residual with the time left over. Yeah, it's some of that either time left over or, or time, you know, like when you're both spending time in the kitchen mm -hmm. and you can start talking with each other that way. And I and former housemates keep cycling through my life um, either because they have, you know, a question or an issue that's something that I know something about or whatever, but um, it's, it's been a delight. Well, you, you hit on one of the other key variables and that is you know being near somebody. You yeah. know, the idea of being, uh, it's an opportunistic thing. Yeah, opportunity has to be there. But what happens, I got a lot of people in some of the surveys they did over the years would say, oh, my best friend moved. You know, they now live on the East Coast or up in the, you know, uh, the Northwest or somewhere else, but yet we're still the best friends. So propinquity may be important and essential for the beginning of a friendship, 
definitely. But the maintenance of it may take more work then in terms of, and with social media, of course, that makes it easier, <clears throat> excuse me, in so many ways. But pro, definitely propinquity, being nearby somebody has to be there in the beginning, in addition to those disclosure and reciprocity elements so that you don't feel always, well, I'm the only one that makes the phone call or initiates the text. The other person never does that. Why am I always making the phone call? Well, that's the reciprocity element that's important there too. But propinquity, uh, nearness, being near someone um, can be modified once it already established as a friendship. Any other examples like that in terms of those early stages of making friends? So, if the, so the people in the dorms, for example, my hunch is that most people's best friends were people who lived near them. You know, the, there was a very famous study that was done many years ago when they did an ask people in a dormitory area, who was the most common person they knew? There was a sociogram, we used to call it. You'd pick somebody and how many people and draw lines between that. And guess what? It turned out to be the person whose room was across from the bathroom or near the staircase that went up and down the dorm because people kept on seeing that person over and over. My office used to be right opposite the Xerox uh, area in Fletcher Hall. And I got to know a lot more people <laughs> than other, some of my colleagues did because they all came there to get the coffee and to Xerox something. So that's the propinquity, that's the nearness that becomes element. Now, obviously I wasn't friends with everybody there and not everybody who lives opposite the bathroom in the dorms got to know everybody because you had to start sharing and disclosing and, and feel some sort of reciprocity. So I think that's the other element that's in there for sure. Yeah. But what happens? Friends come and go. I mean, they come in and out and then we make efforts to try to reconnect over time. I'm gonna read you a quote from a novel by John Barth. He, uh, not as well known today, but he wrote a book called The Floating Opera. This is in the 1960s, he wrote this. Uh, take my glasses off there. That's how much of life works. Our friends float past. We become involved with them, they float on. And we must rely on hearsay or lose track of them completely. They float back again. And we must either renew our friendship, catch up to date, or find that they and we don't comprehend each other anymore. I like that imagery, sort of the floating on, the people come back and forth into your life. I've noticed that with Facebook, I've reconnected with high school friends that I had not seen in X number of years. <laughs> and we started, you know, reciprocating and talking about stuff. A few of them got to the level of a little bit more reciprocity and disclosure, but most of them were just stayed at the superficial level. And that was done off Facebook, obviously. You know, we did it by phone or we did it by other ways of emails or sending people other information. Because Facebook is really limited somewhat to, you know, sort of uh, the acquaintance level, I think. What are you, some of your experiences, especially some of you younger ones who are dealing with social media, uh, how has that changed your friendships? Um, Professor Nardi, I know yes. Lisa Zucker has her hand up. Okay. Can you unmute, Lisa? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh okay. yeah, hi, I didn't see the hand up. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. yeah, feel free to jump in when you just unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, going back to your, your original question, I have, well, I would have had two friends from college uh, from Pitzer. One of them passed away from cancer, so but we were friends up to the end, so that was good, and I still have one now. And then from high school, I have two friends left that I'm still friends with, but we actually lost touch and re, re uh, began. I reignited our friendship at an alumni um, reunion, at a reunion event about oh my gosh, like 15 years later or something. And now actually we're better friends than we were when we were in high school. We were, we were in different cliques, you know, in high school, but we were friendly. And now we, I consider them one of my, you know, in the, in the main core of the group, of my group of friends. So that, the other thing about uh, reciprocating that you were just talking about now is I have a friend who I met at a work and we're really good friends at work 
and outside of work when we work together. And now it's been about, who knows, uh, seven years since we've worked together. We've maintained the friendship, but she's, I've sort of categorized her in the, one of those people from your quote that sort of floats in and floats out. And I, at first I was really um, almost like took it personally, like uh, I'm just not worth her time. But then I realized that she's one of those type A people that um, just can't say no to her job. So I figured, you know what, I'm not gonna take it personally because in the moment when we're talking and connecting, I love our friendship. So I decided to just sort of put a little bow on it and then reach out. And when she gets back to me eventually, then I enjoy it in the moment. That's all. I would like anybody want to comment on that? That's what you do. Let me introduce another another little element, and then we can get get more conversation going too. Uh, I'm not always one that likes to say male versus female, Venus versus Mars, all right? You know those kinds of things, because I think in some ways that's an artifact of looking for differences between two categories, and now three or more if you have. Uh, non-binary and uh, transgender and all those other elements. But, but just take the research that's been done historically about that. And the reason why I hesitate, because sometimes you do differences. For example, I'll give you another example. On average, men are, I'm making this number up, three inches taller than women are on average. You know, 5'8 versus 5'5. Five, five. But variation within category is often greater than it is between. You know, so that's why I hate to sometimes do the artificial, let's look for differences between men and women. But what consistently comes up though, and again, I think there's more variation within. I mean, one of the research I did on gay men's friendship was to look at variation within gender, within the men's element, and show that there were differences between uh, sexual orientation. People have done the same thing with racial differences, with cultural differences. I mean, how do Italians do f a friendship as opposed to a Scandinavian? Uh, you know, all those kinds of elements of, of, of touching and, and hugging and even standing close to one another. There's so many variations by, by social class. Uh, for, uh, and I'll come back to the gender and social class. So for example, middle-class people are much more likely to invite friends into their homes and to do stuff like that to entertain. Whereas working class people will often meet outside the home with their friends after work uh, in a bar or some sort of social, uh, uh, work-related area. But some of the differences, I think, in gender are really more differences about social cultural, social structural differences um, as a sociologist. So for years, people would say men's friendships were often so much related to work situations. Most men would say, you ask them who your best friend is, they'll say their wife. Besides your wife, who's your best friend? Uh, and they sometimes have a difficult time coming up with it. Oftentimes it might be another woman, but not another male. Women have no hesitancy right away to say they have another friend that's a woman after they say their husband or something like that. Um, men's friendships tended to be work-related. So when they stopped that job or that work, they lost their, French, their friends. And I know a lot of people, certainly my parents' generation and a lot of older generations, when they retired, they lost their friendship network or when they change jobs, because men's friendships often came through work. Women's friendships often came through, if they had children, through children, through a school, through uh, other activities, other clubs, in addition to that. Now, that was a model that I think may be a little more dated now, because women are now more in the workplace than they were when a lot of these studies were done. So to me, it becomes not a, a, something biological or psychologically related to being male or female, but it has to do with your social structure, that where you find yourself embedded. Sociologists would say friendship is not necessarily a psychological choice only, that is also part of the social networks you're in. What is your, what is your circumstances like? People's best friends, closest friends, tend to be like themselves in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation, age, occupation, and so on and so forth. Part of that goes back to what Diana said earlier, it's a propinquity, who are you nearby? Who are you with? You know, 
So if you go to college and make friends in college, they're going to be college educated more likely than not. And then you choose certain occupations like that. So to me, it's not necessarily just something that's emotional. It's also structural. Uh, you ask both men and women, what do they want from friendship? And the answer is intimacy. But then you ask, you push a little bit, what does that mean to be intimate? And again, historically, I haven't done research recently, but men would say, somebody I can chat with so about sports. That's what they meant by intimacy. But you ask women and their answer was often something else. Something more about talking about my children, talking about my feelings, about my relationships. Women were more likely, and again, I'm giving you an on average uh, women were more likely to talk about the friendship. Men wouldn't even discuss it, wouldn't talk about that. Um, so I'm a little reluctant to, uh, to reify gender differences. Do you notice any patterns? Or are you looking for patterns that aren't really there and you're ignoring the similarities? Because again, on most studies, when you ask people what they expect of a friendship, what they want from a friendship, the answers are similar how they define that intimacy, how they define that closeness may vary. I hate to say only by gender, but also by race, by sexual orientation, by um, social class, religion, and so on and so forth. What do you think about that thing I'm tossing out now? Karen, I think you're raising your hand. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, my two best friends as an adult, um, one of whom is um, ha passed away maybe five or six years ago. But we became friends because our children at very young age were in the same school in the same class. And we bonded, um, which was a structural sort of thing. We were parents in this, in this school and we bonded because our kids were friends. And, um, all three of us were single moms because of divorce and provided a really wonderful network for each other in terms of helping out with, um, you know, getting kids to school sometimes when we couldn't do it. The other one would, you know, her job would start a little later so she could take the kids and, and um, you know, one of them was home after school and, and so originally we started out talking about our kids and, um, and I don't know if the same thing might have happened if we'd been, you know, different genders, but there's something about being a single divorced mom. I think that's different maybe than being a single divorced dad or a mom with a partner. Mm -hmm. um, that really strengthened that connection and um, just blossomed over the years. And, and this was, you know, in the, in the early 1980s. So it's a long time. And but again, it's not so much that, that um, you know, um, divorced men or divorced women are different because of their gender element, but they may find themselves in different social situations as a result. Correct. You know, again, the structural of, I'm not saying either or, but it's just to me, the structural context in which people find themselves really structures your friendship. As I said earlier, with the residual stuff, your residual time. Now, Diana, you posted something on the chat. I was just looking at that about identity. You know, we have to reimagine identity. Elaborate on that a little bit, what you were thinking, if you feel like contributing that. Well, I... A friend of mine um, was saying that he had the opportunity to, to retire about four years ago, but he didn't know what he would do or, you know, and so he just sort of kept working. Um, and, and he's retired now. I think it's just a, a more difficult transition for men who have, um, been working their entire adult life. Um, and um, I would say, particularly in my parents' generation, um, but you know, certainly some in my generation too. 
uh, so reimagining, yeah, it's sort of, I'm a life coach now and, and um, being able to ask someone, um, you know, what are some things that you had imagined that you wanted to do when you were a child? And, you know, you haven't picked that up yet. Is, is there something that you would like to, to do? And I'm, this painting behind me, both of them were done by my mother when she was a senior. Um, you know, she, she went into painting again. So um, she kind of re reimagined herself that way. Well, thank you. That, that was an interesting mm -hmm. um, thought. Um, not to bring up a negative thing, but what, what ends a friendship? Why would you end a friendship? What, what does it take? I mean, a lot of people say today is somebody just did <laughs> politics, of course. I mean, <laughs> the new wife. How many of you dropped Trump support? <laughs> she has other you know? friends to come in. <laughs> But, but seriously, I mean, that's, I've known, I mean, I've known people who've left, who've lost friends because of, you know, the, the voting patterns. <laughs> but what else does it take? Anybody have thoughts on it? Yeah, Emily, yeah. I yeah, mean, so, well, yeah. I had just typed in a, a question to you about the polarizing effect of politics. And yeah, I, I don't, that. in the, I, I don't, in the past, I don't remember politics playing a very big role in friendship. I mean, I, I had friends, I had no idea what their political inclinations were, mm -hmm. but I think in recent years, it has really become that. And um, on Facebook alone, I have unfriended people that I just couldn't, I just couldn't abide by what they were saying. It was very offensive to me. Um, and so maybe one was a cousin. So there's a difference between have a cousin relationship versus a friend relationship, but still it was painful. Um, and I think also, um, uh, well, to me, that's one of the major things that, that would, and then just lack of contact and lack of, and lack of reaching out or concern or expressions of, hey, how are you doing? I think it's just lack of effort on the parts of some people to maintain the friendship. Exactly. I think uh, maintenance is, becomes a big issue. Hi, Kim. Kim joined us. <laughs> um, the, 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 some friendships end because of some event, you know, like, you know, you find out who they voted for and that's it. I'm never going to talk to them again. I mean, there's something like that or something really bad happened. You know, that, I mean, that's one extreme, you know, but I think most friendships tend to just fade away or to use the quote I used earlier, just float away. You know, there, it, it, it's, it's, because they weren't up in the top tier of your best friends. And other things with residual time, again, that residual notion uh, has limited time. And you start not returning calls. You start not keeping in touch. Uh, I can't do Christmas cards again this year, you know, and so on and so forth. There's this uh, a f drifting away slowly. You know, it's never something abrupt. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I haven't seen you in several years, you know, or months. That's what's always interesting about in-person reunions, obviously now. I mean, I would see, you know, Catherine, I'd see Kim and I'd say, oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. Adam, I haven't seen you in years. But then you can reconnect. And some people make new friends on these reunions. I've known of people who said, gee, I never knew you when I was in college, but now, wow. And they start getting together now and they become really good friends. I mean, I know that's happened. It's happened to me with some former students who uh, my earliest students who are closer in age now to me than the, the gap that appeared to be. And I keep in touch with them as, don't even think of them as former students, you know, and socialize, you know, and, uh, um, uh, you know, so you, you renew these friendships, you renew them, but you also make new ones as a result of these kinds of social structural situations like a reunion. It emphasizes friendship in some ways. The very notion, which is why we were talking about friendship when we were setting this up, how appropriate for a reunion to talk about friendship. I mean, that's what it's about. Old friends and making new ones. And the new ones come out of this for the same reason that other things do. You meet, you find similar connections, you start disclosing over time, oh, you live nearby, and you start meeting more often for coffee and you get together, and now you become 
up in the tier from casual acquaintance. I live down the door from you to now I know you uh, uh, are going to be part of my wedding party or whatever that happens. So well, other thoughts? Uh, I wanted to mention Betty Hubian and Sarah Smith, I think, had questions. Oh, okay. oh, I'm not sure about a question. Oh, I graduated yeah, in <laughs> a comment or two. Yeah. Um, I graduated in 1968. Wow. So I was in the first class, first full class yes. graduate. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that was interesting times. <laughs> yeah. Similar yeah. to my college graduation year. So I understand. <laughs> and um, uh, we we uh, we voted them in, in, I think, two or three years later. <laughs> it's all women. <laughs> And because they would bring more money in. <laughs> that was really the underlying thing. It was really fun anyway. But um, in today, so a lot of my friends from that time, as well as from school, high school and such, they're gone. They've passed away. Or they just aren't interested in carrying on with friendships. They have family, they have other things, and our expectations are beyond what, they're, what they can, can now give. Um, it isn't, doesn't mean I'm totally out of touch with everybody agree with me, because Facebook has helped to bring in back into the picture some of these friendships. Here in South Carolina, when we moved here 16 years ago, it was all new. I didn't know anything about South Carolina. I just remember my mother said at one point, you do not want to go to graduate school in the South. You will not be liked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because so, I had a different view of life. It's uh, people are people kind of thing, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and they had a different kind of view. So here I am, and things have changed, I'm happy to say. But the, I, I serve on boards like the FBI Citizens Academy Association. And uh, so I know a lot of FBI and a lot of men who are with the National Guard, State Guard, who were um, in Afghanistan, this and that, where I was for about two or three months at one point. So we have affinity. And, um, and then um, I serve on infrastructure, too, which is the citizens organization of the critical uh, infrastructure sectors. And uh, I'm a member of the communication sector, which handles all the IT of this and that and all those big things that uh, the wind blows over anyway <laughs> um, uh, and uh, going to some of the meetings i go with the, the men to pick me we go down and i'm just about the only woman in all these things and uh one stopped and they said betty the three of us want to talk to you for a minute and he stopped on the side of the road we have something to tell you men think differently from women <laughs> and i'm thinking oh really <laughs> talk to me. <laughs> and he said, Betty, men are mission focused. Women like our wives, they see around the mission, all the other things around, they really do things that we don't even pay attention to, etc. Thank goodness they do. <laughs> they make life at home very nice. But we are mission oriented. So after that, I started uh, in working with all these men, one who has gotten me, I, I like archery, I've been to the archery range, no one's getting me to the gun range, and I found out that more women are packing heat in this area <laughs> than, than I knew before because of it, so, but he, uh, he, he said, you have to do this, you must do this, this, I use the word mission and mission focused more and more with men in creating some kind of affinity and ground, common ground to build a friendship when I do trust the other person. And uh, there are five women who we've been a group now for about uh, eight years and we live in the same area. So we can get to one another's houses if we want to. Five of them have purchased their own house. They all have kids not living here. And we just will call or text, meet, meet me at, at, uh, at O'Keefe's for shepherd's pie, or meet me at, we're going to the beach, let's have tequila sunset at the beach, things like that. And we have a lot in common and a lot not in common, but the friendships because of it have really, really strengthened. And, um, and I have to say, this is kind of an interesting time in, in life. I look around and they are all about, um, uh, one's going to be 60. Almost all of them are anywhere from 
10 to 15 years younger than I am. And I really appreciate it because they have a lot of energy. <laughs> so it's nice. <laughs> Wait, and, listen, uh, I know we have about five more minutes. So oh, I, I'm sorry. There was somebody else who uh, was asking a question uh, earlier and, Bern and Bernard uh, posted something on the chat about the impact of, of uh, COVID on friendships. I don't know if anybody has anything to say, but uh, oh, I know Adam wants to say. Very, very close for us. We've had uh, several law enforcement uh, and firefighters who have gotten and unfortunately passed away. It's been really uh, devastating in some arenas, and it's very hard on, on their colleagues. They are like family. Yeah. Um, no, I was just going to say that in, in this group, I finally realized that, um, yeah, at this age, in one month, I will be, uh, I will be uh, three quarters of a century old. <laughs> so who else had the question? I'll, I'll, I won't continue. I won't continue, Peter. That's okay, fine. Thank you for sharing that story. Well, somebody else had a comment or was going to say, ask a question, I think. Jill, you said someone else did. Adam, did you have? Adam. Peter, I'm so grateful to you for coming up with this important topic. You know, the paradox is we are more connected than ever through technological means and we're more paradoxically disconnected. Um, loneliness is at epidemic levels. Not long ago, the Surgeon General determined that we were at 35% of chronic loneliness. Four out of five people are actually now acknowledging that they're lonely and that has terrible mental health and physical health implications. And we have all of these books on romantic relationships, but we don't have commensurate books on how to do friendship. So you contributing to this knowledge base is really important. Um, as a psychologist, I frequently hear about really friendable people bemoaning the fact that they had great friends in college, just like you were saying. And uh, due to the fact that they've had to move multiple times, they haven't had time for their friends. Other distractions have come into their lives. They haven't made a priority salience has been lost and uh, one of the things that I do as a psychologist is try to help them reinvigorate old friendships those are kind of the low-hanging fruit um, mm -hmm. to your point they can rediscover um, themselves through their friends um, and to someone else I, I forgetting who was talking about it, it might have been Diana um, uh, cisgender males in particular particularly Western cisgender males um, we are told to be uh, autonomous and um, macho and that doesn't really lend itself well towards fostering and maintaining friendship uh, let alone disclosing and being vulnerable kind of a la Brene Brown um, what, what the memo that has not yet been received is that uh, in order to be courageous we actually have to be vulnerable and this idea of stigma uh, like if I was to really disclose something really a private and personal, maybe I would be thought of as aberrant and no longer friendable and shame. And so, I mean, and it goes even more deep for many cisgender males where they're not even willing to know themselves unto themselves for fear of knowing themselves. Um, and uh, oftentimes the spouses of said male uh, feel the burden of being all of the slots of friendship. Um, Esther Perel talks about the idea that we used to live in villages where we used to be able to rely on a host of different people for different functions. And now we rely on our spouses exclusively to serve every function. So it really, it, it behooves us if we want to have good marriages to have good friendships and, um, and that we select them carefully and that we are cognizant, like that we give them little tests, just like you said, like, can they, can they champion us? As we um, as we disclose, or are they going to shame us? Um, do they have integrity? Can they hold a secret? All of those things. These things take time. So I would say, you know, older friends are amazing, especially because, you know, they've put in the time. Um, but and we hopefully have gotten to know them. But um, it really behooves us to make uh, various types of friends in those concentric circles that you were describing, Peter. I think that was gorgeous. So I'm really grateful to you to, for bringing this subject to the fore. Right now, I think now presents itself with a really great opportunity, given that we're in the midst of the constraints of COVID, to reach out to our friends and say, hey, come on, let's go have a virtual cup of coffee. Let's meet via Zoom. We can do this. Let's reinvigorate this old friendship. Oh, thank you. And Adam, maybe you can post on the chat your TED Talk link. 
happy to do so. It's not yet live. It was oh. presented last week at Cal Poly San Luis oh. Obispo, um, and it will come live on the TED channel in about two or three weeks. Make sure you send it to me, please. Yeah, uh, oh, dude, dude, of course. I mean, of course. <laughs> but but um, um, I, yeah, I, just to end up and just to sort of end our topic, I mean, the two things that, uh, that I began with in talking about uh, disclosure and reciprocity, I think, Adam, you said something important. If there are any gender differences, I mean, that's often where you have um, dominant traditional hegemonic masculinity, restricting people from doing that kind of disclosure. But I think that's what we have to change. It's not so much we have to change what, what friendship is, because it's always going to be reciprocity and disclosure, from my viewpoint, and propinquity, being nearby somebody and all that. It's harder to do it across um, social media. But we have to change what, it's, what we mean by disclosure, because if we can get uh, cisgender men or whoever else has a difficulty in disclosing personal information or sharing that kind of what may look like vulnerability becomes essential. So to me, that's what's changing. It's changing the social structural aspects that allow people to disclose in ways without feeling oppressed, to be alienated, to be bullied, you know, especially with kids in school, um, and to look at those kinds of variations. Uh, that allow people to be self-disclosing, you know, and not to make social disclosure a stigma, you know, because that becomes essential to becoming a good friend with somebody, to have that support network we all need at every age, but especially as we enter, uh, for many people, uh, elder years where we need that kind of support. Any final thoughts or questions? Thanks. Oh, and by the way, just if, if any of you want to hit me on LinkedIn, I'm the only Adam Dorsey out there. Uh, you, uh, I'll be happy to be connected with you and share that link. Sarah. Sarah Smith, are you going to say something? Yeah. I have a great little story about my grandson who's six. And he's had a lot of emotional problems this year being so isolated and separate from other children. He's a single child. And about a, maybe three weeks ago, my daughter took him with a friend of hers and her two girls. And they've known each other for a long time, but they went and got a, a beach house. They live in Florida. And at night, they'd been all playing together without masks and they'd been in the pool and they just had a great time. And at night, my daughter looked over and saw tears in my grandson's mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. And she asked him, what's the matter? And he goes, they're happy tears, they're happy tears. <laughs> And he said, I, I'm playing with my friends with no mask. And, uh -huh. and I think, you know, the friendships that are how we how we recover from COVID for all of our generations are going to be really unique. It's going to be fascinating. Yeah. yeah. It's just so sweet to see this, yeah. this pouring out of just gratitude for what used to be normal. Nicely said. There's a lot of research for people to do who are still doing research on this topic. I mean, it's still relatively speaking, one of the more understudied topics in the social sciences. And uh, I think it's a great thing and an important element in social relationships. To me, it's a key, a cornerstone of the social system and how we define it and how we look at it cross-culturally becomes even more essential, I think, in these difficult times of polarization not just on political issues, but on social issues. It becomes something that really becomes an important element for our psychology, as Adam was saying, but also for the social system, you know, for the social structure to maintain its strength and, uh, and all that. This felt like my freshman seminar. Thank you all. Thank you I mean, so much. I'll let Jill be in, and Catherine be in charge of uh, the timing here. It was, it was so great, to great. It's so great to have you. And you brought up so many pertinent ideas and thoughts and it just made it just brought back all my relationships and just such a warm fuzzy feeling after talking about this but right now there's a social hour if you want to continue talking about relationships or find a new friend but we do <laughs> want to give a warm thank you to professor nardi that was really great and hopefully next year you'll all be there in person and we could then drink wine together and, and toast our whatever beverage of choice you have and welcome each other to a real friendship in person okay? it's a date yeah. It's, it's your date. Let's do yeah. it. And good to see some of my former students again. Adam Thank you. Kim yep. and Catherine and <laughs> all those you. friends. Bye bye. And Susan. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you Peter. Take care of yourselves. Thank you, everyone.